Vice President and Chief Philanthropy Officer. Kim assumed the role after more than a decade of service in higher education at Taylor University and Harding University. Her tenure at Taylor coincided with a record year of fundraising. Before her time at Taylor, Kim was the Executive Director of the American Studies Institute at Harding. She developed student leadership programs, hosted nationally recognized speakers in the lecture series, established program endowments, and solicited support in alignment with the university's mission and program for record fundraising at ASI. Kim earned her EDD from Harding and is the author of scholarly research on mentoring. She has been married for more than 35 years to her husband, Brett, and they are the proud parents of four adult children and two grandchildren. She enjoys family activities, hiking, travel, and reading. Welcome to Club 99. Thank you, Jana. Uh, your tough assignment today. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, Molly, I appreciate you as well. And congrats, Kim. Welcome to Club 99. Our new member streak continues. Anybody want to guess? 33 consecutive meetings with the new member announced. So welcome, Kim. <clears throat> Let's keep it going, y'all. All right, congrats to Julie Brandenberger and Community Bakery for the People's Choice Award last week at the Arkansas Food Hall of Fame Banquet. It's a very cool honor. Um, the Ottenheimer Committee will meet immediately after today's program. Uh, as many of you know, we're planning the 75th anniversary of this incredible program. Uh, and so if you want to get involved, some of the newer members looking for a way to plug in, a great opportunity to plug in and help us with that. We are looking for a few sponsorships to support this effort, so if you're interested in doing that, we'd love to talk to you as well. Next week, please join us for a discussion with America's youngest mayor, Earl Mayor Jalen Smith with Mayor Frank Scott Jr. Should be real fascinating to hear from him about his efforts to transform Earl and the Delta. <clears throat> We've talked a lot about illuminating or the importance of illuminating the rock this year. And we are so grateful as a club today to be able to shine a light on the good works of our area college students and our professional business leaders for all they do and are doing to make a difference in our community. I also want to say thank you to Rex Nelson who recently wrote in his downtown wish list the importance of our goal of lighting the Veterans Memorial Bridge he said, I quote, thanks to the foresight of former Pulaski County Judge Buddy Valines, the Broadway Bridge is the most distinctive of all the bridges connecting Little Rock and North Little Rock. It deserves to be lighted. We concur. We hope that soon we can find supporters we need to make that dream a reality and find another way to illuminate the rock. During our La Petite Roche tricentennial, as many of you know, I will spend my year as president telling unique stories about our region's past 300 years. And since today's honoree has such a special connection to golf, I would like to tell the story of arguably Arkansas's most famous golf match. Be surprised if you know this one. Uh, four grand was a heck of a lot of money back in 1928. So when native Arkansan Alvin Clarence Thomas, better known as Titanic Thompson, one of gambling's most colorful characters, set up a $4,000 golf match, it got a lot of attention. Today, the purchasing power of that amount would be nearly $70,000. Minnesota Fats called Titanic, quote, the greatest action man of all time after he hustled Al Capone and double-crossed Arnold Rothstein. Even writer Damon Runyon, himself a golf hustler, allegedly based his Guys and Dolls character, Sky Masterson, on Titanic's colorful history. Several prominent golfers of the era, Harvey Pinnock, Byron Nelson, Sam Snead, and Ben Hogan, 
have all written about their legendary matches with Titanic. Another one, Lee Elder, one of the best black golfers of all time, served as Titanic's caddy playing ringer in his earlier days. None of their opponents ever suspected Titanic's caddy, who sometimes dressed as a chauffeur, that he could even play a lick of golf. And boy, were they wrong. Situated on the inside of the Willow Beach Oxbow Lake near Scott, Arkansas, Willow Beach Country Club had an old layout designed by Herman Hackbarth, the original pro at CCLR. It was the perfect location for big money matches. Out of town from polite society, yet near the railroad line, providing easy access for city folks to come out and watch. Titanic recruited Dutch Harrison, a young assistant pro at Willow Beach, as his partner. Harrison had just come out of the caddy yard at CCLR and eventually enjoyed a good deal of success in his own right on the pro tours. Titanic knew Dutch would know all the ins and outs of his home course. They were to play Arkansas's top professional golfers, Julius Ackerbloom, who played tour golf, and a young Paul Runyon of Concordia Club, Country Club in Little Rock. One of Arkansas's best ever golfers, Runyon would enjoy a storied career in professional golf, winning 27 tournaments, including two majors, the PGA Championships in 34 and 38. And in his first Masters tournament in 1934, he was paired for the first 36 holes with tournament host and co-founder Bobby Jones. He would win the money title that year and later serve on two U.S. Ryder Cup teams. Thompson promised Harrison 10% of the winnings, but he had heard a rumor that Ackerbloom and Runyon had paid him off to throw the match. Harrison later recalled that, quote, it really shook me when Mr. T backed me up against a car in the parking lot and poked a 45 revolver into my belly. This was before the match. No doubt that ensured his loyalty and the promise of a clean match. Sort of a clean match. Widely known as a right-handed player, Titanic Thompson took secret golf lessons in San Francisco to sharpen his lefty skills. In fact, few knew he was a skilled natural lefty. In true Titanic form, he negotiated a stroke and a half on the first tee to play, and you guessed it, left-handed. Back and forth throughout the match, it thrilled the large gallery that had gathered in from Little Rock. Runyon even had five birdies on the day. But Titanic and Harrison went to the short 310-yard 18th hole one up. Titanic hit his approach shot close for a sure birdie, meaning Ackerbloom would have to sink a 60-foot eagle putt to have the match. Widely known for not being much of a putter, Ackerbloom, now under intense pressure, remarkably sank the putt. The crowd roared. Playoff discussions ensued, but neither team was up for extra hoes. Now, Titanic was never one to leave money on the table, but even he agreed it was just too emotionally draining and physically challenging for him to continue. So they agreed on a draw. Of course, Titanic would go on traveling the country, scamming golfers everywhere with his new ringer, Dutch Harrison. And Runyon would soon begin his storied pro career. Ackerbloom continued on with his. But no doubt, none of them would ever compete in another one as intense as the $4,000 match near the Oxbow Lake in Scott, Arkansas. And that's our Illuminating the Rock story for this week. Next, I'd like for College Scholarship Committee Chair, 
Dr. Jay Barth to present our annual college scholarship recipients. And then after a video about Scott Ford and his family, I'd like for past president Elizabeth Small, chair of our business and professional leader of the year committee to introduce this year's special honoree. Jay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am uh, thrilled to uh, uh, put forward um, recipients, uh, 14 new recipients of uh, Rotary Scholarships uh, today. And I want to thank uh, the other uh, representatives of each of the four institutions that put forward honorees who are very helpful in, in making this happen. Christian O'Neill at University of Arkansas Little Rock, uh, Dr. Lazo Razaman Fumanjata of uh, Philander Smith College, uh, Dr. Summer Dupro at UA Pulaski Technical College and Dr. Jerome Green of Shorter College. Um, I'll remind you our criteria for scholarships are first students who are in their last year at the institution and of course that differs uh, between four-year and two-year institutions. A grade point average of B or better. Um, evidence of university or community service, financial need, and when possible uh, we certainly want to focus on non-traditional students who have returned uh, to college. You will likely remember that last year we were able to increase the award for each of the scholarships uh, to $2,000 um, and uh, the two students from Shorter College do share one of those $2,000 awards. The really great news is that now over the life of the scholarship program after today's 14 new recipients, 230 awardees have been named over those years and we have now exceeded $300,000 in scholarships that Rotary has put forward for students. So I think that's a, something we're celebrating. So um, not all the recipients could be here today because of, of some conflicts, but many of them are here. And uh, what uh, um, uh, um, the Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Denver was going to come down. He is going to, he's got the uh, certificates. And then I'm going to ask when, uh, if they are available, uh, the chancellors or leaders of each of the institutions to come up and also take a, a photo with the recipient. And so recipients, you'll just come forward when that's possible. And so uh, Chancellor Drail is here. And if you want to come on up, uh, Christy, and you and Denver can um, be here for a photo. Got a, got a camera? All right. All right, the first uh, scholarship is the Eugene Pfeiffer uh, Scholarship, uh, and the student's, uh, student recipient is Mariana Abarca Chavez. Mariana, are you here today? Okay, she is not available. Uh, the second Eugene Pfeiffer Award is Jacob Blackburn. Jacob? Here. Right. Um, the James H. Freiburg um, Scholarship goes to Melissa Vance. And I know Melissa is here. Come on up, Melissa. Oh, Melissa's with you. Hey, Denver. Denver, Denver. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Um, the uh, Louis Caudel uh, Criminal Justice uh, Scholarship uh, is Nikita Lambert. Nikita, come on up. Thank you. Um, 
the Charles Hathaway Rotary uh, Scholarship goes to Hannah Jones. Is Hannah here? There's Hannah. The Virginia Bailey Entrepreneurial Education Scholarship goes to Perry Hunter. Perry? Is Perry here? All right. And I know the next uh, honoree is not here, but the AP Vibacher uh, Endowed Scholarship goes to Victoria uh, Karnakova. And then finally, I believe he is here, the David Rainwater Endowed Scholarship goes to Brian Hernandez. Brian? Thank you, Christy. That's the last of the UA Lorac. Um, now, for we have a couple of uh, Philander Smith uh, awards. Um, and uh, Laza, if you'll come forward as a representative for Philander. Um, the first scholarship is uh, we have two Dr. Crawford J. Mims uh, scholarships for Philander Smith, uh, Drizelle Washington. And the second MIM scholarship goes to Natresia Caesar. Two uh, awardees from Shorter College. Is anybody from Shorter here? Then, uh, oh, yes, uh, I, I, was, I was seeing if Dr. Green was here. But um, first up, uh, Mercedes Williams uh, receives the Club 99 Foundation Scholarship from Shorter. And the second honoree is Caleb King. Is Caleb here? All right. And finally, we have uh, two. Uh, so uh, Chancellor uh, Dupro comes up. We have two honorees from University of Arkansas Pulaski Technical College. Uh, the first is the Governor Frank White Scholarship. And uh, Christy Spann is the recipient. Christy. Our final award, uh, our uh, scholarship recipient, the Club 99 Foundation Scholarship, uh, Brianna Messick. Brianna? All right. Let's give a hand to all of our scholarship recipients. I grew up on drinking Folgers. Uh, I did. I, I think Folgers is a great cup of coffee. I was not brought into it through the, um, what I call the fancy pants coffee um, interest. I told him when he was about 10 or 12 that he'd never work 
in a public company with me. It wouldn't justify what he did. He'd never get credit for it. And he worked for Jack Stevens uh, about nine years as his personal aide. And Jack called me one day and said, Joe, I know Scott better than you do as a business guy, and you don't have anyone out there in his league as far as capabilities. And he said, I'm gonna call some of your directors and tell them I think you should come out there as a director and a senior officer. I said, Jack, he said, do you mind? I said, Jack, you're the largest shareholder I've got. Whatever you're gonna do is fine with me. And he did. Scott came, proved himself, did it all. So that's how he ended up working with me. I heard it said like this, and this is actually something that Jack Stevens had told us. There are two types of people in the world. There are people who walk into a room and they say, here I am, hey. And then there are people who walk into a room and they say, there you are. And that's who he is. Scott is a fighter, like a good hearted fighter. He loves to fight. He loves to compete, to win. He loves hard challenges, risk. And I, I think part of that is because when something is really hard and really worth doing, it brings out the absolute best in us and other people. He want all employees to do well. He expects them to do their best. And if they do their best, we'll do well as a company. He has compassion. And the prime example of that is West Rock Coffee. He went to Rwanda, found out that the farmers there uh, were making actually a little bit less than half the world market price. So in Rwanda, there were two exporters and they were paying 50% of what everybody else in the region got paid. And they were doing it because they could get away with it. it. Just made him so mad he couldn't stand it that people were taking advantage of them and keeping half of what they should be getting to feed their family. And that's how we got in West Rock Coffee. So our business model is built on paying a fair price so that we are, and investing in the farmers whose products we buy in their education, agricultural education, financial literacy, community building. Um, and, and we do that in a, in a vehicle where we are stewards of other people's money that has come along our, uh, alongside ours and trying to take that to a broader and broader footprint around the developing world. So the reason we want to be big in the coffee business is because the bigger we are in terms of serving customers, the bigger the vacuum pull that we're able to have on the ground to help people get a fair price. And if we do that at a for-profit system, then we'll be in business to come back year after year. This is why we built it in a for-profit model. Charities will run out of money. If I built it dependent upon charity and then one day you don't have it, then those women uh, don't have anybody to buy their crop. And so you have to build a for-profit model, which allows the poorest of the poor to get out of poverty, and then it allows for the system, the company within the system, to show up every year to buy their crop. That's a great, that's a great model. And there are very few public companies that are built explicitly on that model. And we wanted to be, frankly, we wanted to show that that model works for our customers, for the farmers, and for the shareholders. And so we take it as a little bit of a challenge that that's a hard thing to do. And a lot of people say it can't be done, which we think is great fun. We're gonna show them that it can. I was on the very first trip actually in 2005. I was 11 years old whenever we went to Rwanda. He took us there for, for an education. Uh, and he said a line once, which completely ruined me, which was never let school get in the way of your education. So if you, if you can go see the world, go see the world. The mission was very real for our family, just because of Joti's life and what he grew up through. Joti had two brothers and neither of them right, made it through the Great Depression alive, right? And so, because uh, poverty really does have an impact on people. And so when we saw other people being subjugated and it rings true. And when you, when you see that mission and you get to do it with people you love and people you like, it's easy. Growing a business, is not as simple as I have an idea, I'm gonna go out and execute the business plan and, vo and voila, you know? We weren't a manufacturing operations background family. We just made all of the mistakes that you can make to get to this point. And resiliency is key and you have to be willing. And to endure and to put everything back up on the line post the sale of Altel, to try and help a generation of farmers just like he witnessed in his own father's life, going from 
growing up on a dirt floor, grabbing a brick out of the fireplace to stay warm, is how Joe T grew up. And to be able to see that same lifestyle happen in, in Rwanda, one country, I think he saw that same opportunity to help impact one life in Rwanda, and it grew to this business. But again, taking an idea and living out the next 14 years was nothing short of hard work and grace towards people and owning mistakes and celebrating the small wins. Because if you can't celebrate when you should, you don't, you don't deserve to keep winning. You have to work as hard as you possibly can. You have to inspire as much as you possibly can because it's really worth doing and it's really gonna take everything you've got to pull it off. I'm working with him and I just try to support him where I can. And it's a pleasure to watch him work. He's good with people. He encourages people, he supports people, he's a motivator, and yet he expects you to do well. And, and if you don't do well, he'll sit down and talk to you about it. But he's fun to watch. And, and he's really, as a son, I say that proudly, uh, it's a real joy for me just to watch what he's done. And as he told me one time, he said, Daddy, you taught me to give. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm very proud of him. Welcome to the UA Little Rock School of Business. A long-standing partnership with the Rotary Club of Little Rock brings us here today to commemorate and recognize Scott T. Ford as the 2023 Business and Professional Leader of the Year. I love being in business, and all I've ever wanted to do was be in business and help grow businesses in this state, in this community. Uh, I, am, I am blessed beyond blessings to have had mentors that invested in me. It's just a perfect marriage between all these amazing people who have received this award over the years. And for us, as the Rotary Club of Little Rock, to be able to have a permanent location to celebrate these individuals who have made such an incredible impact on our community and our state and frankly, our world. When asked, when asked to describe Scott Ford, his sons used the following words and phrases, dedicated, incredible, cheerleader, patient, resilient, gracious, observant, transparent, and one who studies everything. In the office they call him Scott, and each one chooses to walk alongside him as part of their personal and important West Rock journey. We honored Joe Ford in 1992, and we honor Scott Ford today as the 2023 Business and Professional Leader of the Year. The students and teachers in this room will recognize Scott, who turns theory into reality. The business owners will understand the passionate drive of one who overcomes and creates challenges. The Rotarians in this room will recognize one who has a heart that surpasses all. Now, we all want to hear the rest of the story. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Ford. I hadn't seen that video. That's a dirty, rotten trick. Uh, thank you, thank you, fellas. Um, it's it's a true honor to get to represent the people at West Rock Coffee. Um, and when Elizabeth called me and said, "Would you, you know, receive this award?" My instinct, which is an instinct that you know I've had for a long time, is to say, "No, thank you." Um, you know, I wouldn't know what to do wouldn't know what to say. It's not really what I do. I don't want to run for office. Uh, and, um, but I thought, you know, uh, I do tell the story. I tell it all over the world, but I don't really ever tell it here in Little Rock. And I thought, well, maybe 
maybe I'd actually tell the real story of West Rock Coffee and, uh, you know, kind of as a gift to these students that are about to embark on the next phase of their life uh, and who are overcoming the hurdles and burdens that life has. And everybody's got a story. Every family's got a story. Um, hello, Bob. How are you, buddy? And so I, um, I thought, well, maybe I'll just do that. So um, the real story about West Rock Coffee, where are we? Let's go to the end. Today, we're the largest provider of other people's coffee in the country. Now, if you won't report this out publicly, we do McDonald's and Wendy's and Chick-fil-A and IHOP and Denny's and Col Columbia Farms and Circle K and the list goes on and the big distributors that sell to universities and hospitals. So that's who we make coffee for, and um, we're about to build the largest roast to ready to drink facility in the world. It's in Conway, Arkansas. It's the old Kimberly Clark plant. It's 500,000 square feet. Thank you, Ted Dickey, for getting all that together. And it's another 500,000 square feet uh, distribution and packaging center that's going in about two miles down the road to support it. Uh, it'll be the largest in the world, and it's going to be Every major brand name you've ever heard of is going to be a customer in, in that facility. We are thrilled to get to bring that kind of work. We will employ in the next three years between Little Rock, North Little Rock, and Conway over a thousand people um, providing service to the biggest brands in the country. So that's the fun part. You know, we went public last year. And we were the, I guess we were one of the, we were, we were called the DSPAC of the year, which is, I don't think it'll award you really want to line up and go get. Well, hey, French, I didn't see you sneak in over there. So we were one of the top performing stocks in the new issue last year, and so that's all good. And we actually have our earnings call this afternoon. We're not going to talk about all that here today. But uh, that's all gone well, and we're thankful for that. But all of that's the fruit of, as Joe calls, Joe says, you know, it's like a, a country music singer, you know, a 14 year overnight success. You know, you, you, you didn't ride the bus and sleep in the back of the car running up and down those two lane highways for 14 years uh, to finally actually break through and have something that people are interested in. And so I just want to tell you, as a, as a matter of encouragement, you know, you look at the list of people that have won this award and it's, it's a lot of the who's who in the, Arcan in the Little Rock business community. I'm old enough that I worked for a couple of them and worked around a bunch of them. I actually worked for three or four of them that were on that list. Uh, I worked for the Stevens family for 10 years uh, here in Little Rock. Then I, all the Altel brethren were here that took me when I was, when I didn't know anything. I was 33 and, and they were looking for somebody that could stay around and last long enough to see if this wireless business might turn into anything. And I didn't know anything. And so Charlie and Denny, Howard, every Bob. I remember Bob when you sat down and you said, hey, would it help you if I actually drew you a diagram of what a T1 line is? And I went, my gosh, I've been looking for you. I have no clue. I didn't know anything. We're sitting in building one. I remember it to this day. Um, I'd never been around a public company except to, as an investor. So Denny Fair was the CFO and had to walk me through. No, 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 you can't say that. Say this. Don't. Well, that's really funny, but you can't say that. Don't say that. You, and, you know, just all of the things that you have to be trained in and brought up in. And so a lot of those guys are here today. And my thanks are to all of you. But I really wanted to just say thank you for, for this one thing. All the money I made at Altel, unfortunately, I had to put on the line to get West Rock Coffee going. I had to personally guarantee all the debt. Nobody would lend me a dime. We had, we had done a $29 billion leverage buyout, the largest corporate entity ever bought by private equity, sold for a check in the history of mankind on the planet. I remember signing the documents. Some of you guys remember uh, all of that, Jerry. It took me an, three hours to go through and sign the documents to bring down a $29 billion change of control transaction for a single check. Not one person in the beginning would lend me a dime. Eventually, I found John and Rennie Rutledge. Amen? Give them, let's give them a standing round of applause. John and Rennie Rutledge said, Everybody else had said, well, we'd be glad to loan you whatever you put on deposit. Anybody an entrepreneur? You know, how's that working for you? <laughs> yeah, right. I was ruder than that, actually. Uh, the vice chairman of J.P. Morgan, I, I think I had two words for him and left. Um, 
hey, 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 they, this ain't Sunday school class. I'm just telling you what is. <laughs> the Rutledges, uh, they required everything I had in the world to be put up, but that's okay. That's fair. I didn't, you know, at that juncture, I'd never run a coffee business. Why would you expect that we would be successful at it? We would expect you to fail. 90% of the new businesses that start up fail. 90% of the ones that survive the first year fail the second year. Why am I going to be any different than that, right? So, you know, sign on the note. But I believed in what we were doing, and I believed in the team. And I want you to meet the team. So this is a group of people. I sent text messages last night, and I said, would you come? My wife was, is in Florida, was planned to be down there long before I even knew this award was coming. She sends her regards. She's the much better half of the two of us. <laughs> This is the team that I, I sent them a text message. And I said, will you come to the Clinton Library tomorrow and have lunch with me and sit at my table? And they all said yes, but here's the wrinkle. If I'd said, I'm in a firefight south of the Mexican border with a drug cartel, will you come? They'd have come to that too. See, students, it's the people you do life with that matter. It's the mentors that you get. Thank God somebody outside of academia, because I was no stellar star. I wouldn't have made it to any of the things you guys have already won. But they took, an, they took a bit of a risk, saw whatever they thought might be a spark that they could do something with, and they invested in me. Who your mentors are and who are the people you do life with, it's all the difference. It's all there is. You're talking to a C student from Central High School. We've built the largest private label coffee business in the country. It'll be the largest in the world three years from now. Earnings are released this afternoon. Don't go trade this afternoon. <laughs> Between now and then. What time do they release, Pleasure? 4.30. <laughs> because this group of people, when we said, hey, can that be done? So Matt Smith, Matt Smith's over here drinking his iced tea. Matt Smith, stand up. Matt Smith's from outside of Burnet, Burnet, because it rhymes with Burnet, Burnet, Texas. Matt Smith's one of the first guys I ever met in Rwanda. He was over there doing uh, volunteer work, and we had we had come up with the idea that if you're going to change the market, if you're going to get a fair price to these women, these two people that were collapsing the uh, monopolizing the market, they had to have a plant. If we had we had to have a plant, well, how many of you know anything about building a plant? Not me. I'd never built a plant. I never even supervised building a plant. I didn't know anything about it. I said, Matt, what do you think about this idea? And he went, well, it's just atrocious, but I think we can do it. And so he's employee number one at West Rock Coffee. And I said to him, you can rebuild a plant. You can build a coffee plant. And he goes, sure, no problem. I said, how in the world can that be true? And he said, well, my dad was an electrician. I said, if your dad was a brain surgeon, I wouldn't let you be stirring around in my head. <laughs> Why, why should I give you my money? And he said, because I can do it. And I believed him, and he did it. Chris Pledger was an outside lawyer with a promising career in the legal profession. And I said, hey, Pledger, he'd been going to Kazakhstan and Yemen and Chile, or I don't know, there's lots of stands. And I said, Chris, would you go with me to Rwanda? You know, they just had a genocide over there about 10 years ago. The economy's a wreck. We're going to go build a coffee mill from scratch. I got us a guy who knows how to do it. <laughs> Can you help me actually get it incorporated and actually get this underway and figure out what we're doing? And he said, sure, that's just an atrocious idea. Let's do it. Because he understood the impact it could have in people's lives if we were successful. So at the end of the day, Chris Pleasure, stand up and say hi to everybody. Ted Dickey's who I called when, I, when everybody else thought I'd lost my mind. Ted Dickey's who I called when I thought I might have lost my mind. So Ted Dickey, stand up. Take, take a bow. All my family, my dad, my three sons, one of my daughter-in-laws, my first cousin, rallied, rallied, rallied. And you're going, what, what are you rallying around? Well, let me tell you the real truth about being an entrepreneur. So I'm seven or eight years into it. It's Christmas, about 2015. My wife says to me, we've got 
no grandchildren at the time, but three kids in the house and all that. And she goes, hey, what's going on? And I went, we need to talk. So we sat down, sat on the couch in front of the fireplace. I said, look, probably this is all going to be fine. <laughs> probably. And I said, you know, five things bad would all have to happen in a row. I mean, you know, I mean, that doesn't happen very often, right? Five atrocious things, like the price going against you, and you don't make a sale, and you can't meet your margin call because your bank line's tapped out. Things like that. Anybody ever started a business? Right? Like, Pledger's like, hey, Scott, did you pay your credit card bill this month? I said, well, I paid down on it. Well, how'd you pay down? We'll just make that work. So I sit in with my wife and I said, hey, you know that $100 million we made at Altel? I said, it's a um, reasonable chance we're going to lose all that. If these five things happen and none of these five good things happen, we're going to lose all of that. And I owe you a heartfelt apology. But at this juncture, this business works or I'm going down with it. We've been together since we were 18. We dated all through college. We graduated in May, got married in June, moved to New York in July. My dad gave me $600 cash, shook my hand, and said, good luck at our, at our wedding reception. So we're sitting in front of the fireplace, and she sits there for a second. You know, you're taking it in right now. You're like, what a fool. I know what you're thinking, because I thought it too. What moron would do that? You don't even know these women's name, and they don't know yours. And if you're not doing that and running for office, you really are a moron. It's easy to say that, right? Why is it easy to go to that place? Because it's true. On some wonderful, true level, it's all true. So she sat there, and she looked in the fire for about 30 seconds, and then she said the most significant words that any human being has ever spoken to me more than I love you from my parents, which I got every day, more than I do when she said, well, let's get married. She looked in the fire for about 30 seconds, which was a long 30 seconds. And she said, well, we started with 600 bucks. If that's what we go back to, we'll just have to do it again, won't we? Can you imagine, can you imagine that being the answer? from any sane person after what I just told them? I couldn't. I was overwhelmed. And yet a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, asked me years later, he said, can I ask you a, you know, kind of a personal question? I said, hey, it's just raw. It just is what it is. Fire away. And he said, how many times did she bring that back up? I used to want everybody to answer that, get the meter going, you know, Bob? <laughs> Can you imagine that as an answer? Right? That's a tough woman. That's a woman that, would, that would, would be anywhere for any pain that had to be endured. And that is what building a business really looks like underneath. So, You'll see, well, it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars today. Well, big pooey, big whoop, right? The impact that we have on the farmers around the world, what started in Rwanda, is now in 35 countries. If she wobbles right then, it's nowhere. If she wobbles with, hey, that's just way too aggressive, you moron, I'm out. Or, hey, how about you just give me my half? If she wobbles, it's over. Today, it's the largest enterprise in the country that does what it does. We're in 35 countries. We price fairly the coffee products for millions of women who are trying to keep their children alive by living a subsistence farmer life today. All because the people around me stuck. And so that's really all I have to say. If you say, what can I learn from, from you, your idiocy? Surround yourself with people that will stick. Mentor others. Submit to mentorship. 
When you don't think you need a meter, a mentor that's 10 or 20 years ahead of you, do a little self-check. You're prime. That's the sign. You do. He's 70 years old and still getting mentored by people in their 80s. At one, he's 85 now and be 86 this summer. But I watched him continuously put his life in front of other people and say, here's what I'm thinking, here's what I'm doing, what do you see? What do you see that I don't see? How would you handle this? What would, have, what, as Jack Stevens used to say to me all the time, because he didn't, he was, he was hard to mentor. <laughs> but he would think out loud, so he'd let me at least play along at home. <laughs> and he would say, what would a good player do? Well, a good player would surround himself with people that will stick, and he would make sure that he or she is plugged into mentors that are 10, 20 years ahead of them, because at the end of the day, your education isn't going to do that for you. And at the end of the day, anything you try to build is going to test you all the way back down to the core. And it's those people, when they gather around you, when they show up as soon as you send a text, wherever you are, whenever you are, that make all the difference. And so I received this award and thank you very much for it so that I can tell their story. I love you all and I'm so proud of you. Thank you, Jay and Elizabeth. Congratulations, Scott. That was unbelievable. Thank you for your incredible and compassionate words and of encouragement. I hope the scholarship recipients were encouraged. I hope all of us were encouraged. I know I was. Also, one of the cool things I love about this award today, and I mentioned this to Joe and to the family when we worked on the video, um, they are the first father-son duo, believe it or not, First father-son duo to receive our Business and Professional Leader of the Year Award after, you guessed it, Jack and Warren Stevens. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> I want to thank Terry Rasco for the nomination. Terry, incredible job wherever you are. Thank you for making this a reality today. Scott, thank you for saying yes. Um, we're doing a couple of things in your honor. Well, number one, uh, we're bringing back our scholarship for Arkansas Baptist, okay. and it's going to be in the name of the Scott T. Ford Scholarship. Okay. So that's going to be something we'll be doing uh, for this year in your name. We have a plaque for you that represents the award today, so I'll pull that out in just a second. Um, and as our tradition goes uh, for our Business Professional Leader of the Year honoree recipient, uh, you will receive the highest honor that Rotary can bestow upon someone, and that's our Paul Harris Fellow. So I want to give you that as well. Someone say cash prize? Yeah. <laughs> so it, you can wear it if you want. You don't have to. Well, thank you. It's got a pin involved as well, so you can wear that proudly at all your... My rotary Future board. rotary meetings. Yeah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and then, uh, got it. I still got it. Let's go ahead and give him that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then here's your plaque. All right. Well, would you like a photo of this yeah. plaque? Yeah. Can, can you put that in the office? Yeah. <laughs> and then, as part of our uh, our for my year as president, our Illuminating the Rock year, we are doing uh, speaker gifts for all our speakers this year, and we are giving them books as, a, as an example of the books we're going to give by Little Rock Connected Authors to all of our area Little Rock School District uh, resource centers and libraries, or elementary school libraries. And this is an example of one of the books that we will give in your name and every speaker that was with us this year mm -hmm. at the end of the year. So I wanted to Very nice. make sure you have that. Well, thank you. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> yeah, you need a bag. <laughs> I got <laughs> All right. If you were a scholarship recipient, please stick around and let's do a group photo. If Scott will be so kind enough to stick around briefly, maybe we could do a quick photo with 
the scholarship recipients and Scott. I think that would be awesome if you don't mind. And then next week, reminder that America's youngest mayor, Earl Mayor Jalen Smith, will be with us uh, with Mayor Frank Scott Jr. Please don't miss it. And with that, we are adjourned.